Morning, church. It is good to be with you, and it is good to introduce to you our learning track today. Anti-racism is important work. We see the ways in which racism has wrecked havoc in places like Kentucky, Minnesota, and also in Oklahoma, in your town, in your neighborhood, racism has affected everything. But thankfully, the Bible gives us another way to go. Today's speaker is the Reverend April G. Johnson. She serves as the Minister of Reconciliation for the Christian Church in the United States and Canada. She brings to this work a deep passion for racial understanding, justice, and compassion. As the Minister of Reconciliation, Reverend Johnson facilitates the church-wide process of awareness, analysis, and action toward healing the fractures in the body of Christ that are caused by systemic racism. In her capacity as both a pastor and administrator, the Reverend Johnson emphasizes the importance of relationship building across difference as one of the critical ways that we embody and extend God's unyielding grace. And so it's awkward to clap for a screen. I invite you to lift your hearts with to put a smile on your face as we receive the grace and wisdom of the Reverend April G. Johnson this morning. Good morning. Good morning. I apologize for that. I um, would like, I am very bad at Zoom first off and monitoring what I'm saying and monitoring the chat. So um, if you can't hear me or if I freeze, will you please flail whatever you need to do? Like, hey, let me know so that I might restart my video. Um, good morning, saints of God in Oklahoma region. It is my pleasure to be with you uh, in your 2020 Regional Assembly, your virtual Regional Assembly. Um, isn't it like God to remind us just how gifted the Holy Spirit has blessed us to be that we might be able to pivot in our planning and still be able to be together, at least 200 of us, in our planned regional assembly. So I'm so grateful for each of you for being here this morning. And I am hoping that we can um, have a conversation that is generative, that is blessed by the Holy Spirit, that opens us up, that reminds all of us that we are all learners and teachers, but that we are all blessed by God to be called God's disciples. I am going to share my screen now and hopefully it works. And I can see a few of you, Pam, you are on my screen. So you are the one who will tell me if I freeze up or if my sound goes away so that I might log in on another device. <clears throat> so this morning, I am excited about your theme it comes out of one of my favorite gospels in the Bible. Now, of course, if you had a theme in another gospel, it's quite possible I might say that as well because I absolutely just love the scriptures. On this morning though, I am excited that we are going to be talking about the call of Jesus. Your theme fixed on Jesus and then the Bible and anti-racism is a provocative theme and I'm so glad that you chose this. So I pray uh, that we will posture ourselves uh, to be provoked. Uh, the conversation about racism is never a comfortable conversation. What is happening in our nation, what is happening in our hearts and our spirits, our, and our spirits uh, is not comfortable. And so I want to um, invite you to be in a posture uh, to be provoked. But first things first, you will hear your scripture on many times today. I understand that worship follows me. So I want to begin our conversation by talking about what does it mean if we're having, if, I, if this 
study that we're doing this morning is the Bible and anti-racism. Do we have a shared understanding of what it means to be anti-racist and what anti-racism is? And so I clipped this uh, from uh, an article on Vox Media because it quoted one of my favorite authors, Beverly Tatum Daniel, around the definition of racism. And um, I chose this um, description of her definition because many of you are familiar with Ibram Kendi and his book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, and uh, offers that uh, anti, to be anti-racist is not is the opposite of racist. And I would push back on that and say, I think it's a little more complex than that. Let's be clear that even Kendi has a PhD and I do not, but I want to say that it is not enough to claim an anti-racist identity as Christians and to say that if I am non-racist or I see myself as not having a racist bone in my body, but I too can embody the identity as being anti-racist. And so um, school teacher Christina Torres says in quoting Beverly Tatum Daniel that racism, uh, to be anti-racist is, is like being on a moving walkway. We are all conscripted into this narrative of racism, whether we like it or not. We live in a racialized society and culture. And so Tatum Daniels says that it's like being on a moving walkway where we're all moving and saying that we're not racist. But if we're on this moving walkway and claiming that we're non-racist or not racist, but we're just kind of standing still on this walkway, we are still complicit in perpetuating societal racism because we don't get to say we're not a part of society. And Torres challenges us that to be anti-racist is to walk in the other direction. I think that is very provocative. I think it's disturbing. And I think to be a Christian in such a time as this, is to be provoked and to have the courage and the confidence that the Holy Spirit has given us the gifts and graces to walk in a different direction. So I'm gonna show you a video um, that kind of gives us an idea of what we mean by uh, what we mean about, about racism. And again, I'm gonna to look to Pam and make sure that you all can hear me, um, hear the video. I've got a challenge for you. Try talking about racism with your friends, family, or coworkers, and get ready to watch people squirm. So let's push through the discomfort. Don't worry, you can do it. We're gonna talk about racism. Well, the dictionary defines racism as the hatred or intolerance of another race or races. Well, yes, but racism's a little more complicated than that. The dictionary offers a very simple explanation, because it's just the dictionary. If you want to understand racism, you need to talk sociology. And sociology explains racism as a combination of prejudice and power. <laughs> well, isn't that just convenient? Let's just ignore what the dictionary says. No, we're not ignoring the dictionary, just going a little deeper. Think of it this way. If your car breaks down, you don't look up car in the dictionary to try and fix it, you go to a mechanic. So when it comes to getting the nitty gritty of understanding how racism works, I say we should probably defer to sociologists because, you know, they study how people, organizations, and institutions work. It's kind of their job. So here are five things everyone should understand about racism. Ugh! Talking about racism is so exhausting. It's like no matter what I do or what I say, someone's gonna call me a racist. Good people can unintentionally say and do racist things. Racism isn't just burning crosses and racial slurs. It's not always a conscious hatred or dislike. People automatically associate saying something racist with being a bad person. And while we can agree that being racist is bad, good people can say racist things or just wind up supporting racist institutions and practices without even realizing it. Oh, so 
Now it's my fault if I accidentally do something. We're not playing the blame game here, but accidents can still be hurtful. It's important to remember that intent isn't the issue, it's the impact. Like if I accidentally step on your toe, it's an accident, but it still hurts. And I can't just pretend that I didn't step on your foot. I have to acknowledge it, say that I'm sorry, and be more careful with my big ass feet. If you want to get technical, there's really no such thing as race. We are all the human race. It's a social construct. Race is a social construct, but that doesn't mean racism isn't real. A social construct is a category, perception, or idea created and developed by society, and then it's applied to individuals or groups. So yes, we're all part of the human race, but the human race did this funny thing where they categorized everyone based on skin tone and regions. Even though social constructs are made up, they're still real. I mean, money is a social construct, Fundamentally, it's just a piece of paper, but it still keeps people up at night and has a huge effect on our day-to-day -day lives. Marriage, fashion, good and evil, they're all social constructs, but they're still real things. The same is true for race. White, black, pink, purple, polka dots. I don't know why we need all of these labels. Let's just not see race. Just see everyone the same. Colorblindness is not gonna fix racism. It's a good idea in theory, but ignoring race is not gonna solve racism. Race isn't the problem. Treating people differently based on race is the problem. It's okay to see my race. I mean, it's kind of hard to ignore how someone looks. There's nothing wrong with seeing our differences. Our differences make us kind of cool. Okay, but when are we gonna talk about reverse racism? Reverse racism is not a thing. I've been bullied, beaten up, and called all sorts of names in my lifetime, and you're gonna tell me that's not racism. Whoa, that sounds awful. I'm sorry, none of that stuff is okay. But those are examples of racial prejudice, not racism. That's because racism isn't just about individuals. It's about institutional power. Racial prejudice is not cool, but when a person of color discriminates or stereotypes a white person because of their race, in the United States, they don't have the institutional power to back them up and say that those feelings are okay. Institutions are things like schools, government, the military, corporations, and our justice system. All of these things shape how people of color are treated as a group and as individuals. That's because racism is not just on a person-to-person -person basis. It's big picture things, like people with traditionally Latino or black sounding names having a harder time getting job interviews, even when they have the same qualifications as white people applying for the same job. Or people of color facing harsher prison sentences for petty crimes in comparison to white criminals. It's also harder for people of color to get home loans on top of housing discrimination that often keeps them out of predominantly white neighborhoods. This is how individual feelings about people of color are supported by institutional power. Prejudice of any kind isn't okay, but it's important to understand that prejudice and racism aren't the same thing. Huh, I never thought about it like that. Well, you are not the only one. Racism is complicated and overwhelming to think about, even for me. But understanding what racism is and what it isn't is the first step in fighting against it. So what are some misconceptions that you've heard about racism? Or maybe some misconceptions that you had in the past? Let us got a challenge for I want us to take a moment and I to just kind of let that sink in I just completed two weeks of a train the trainer course online um, with 25 new um, training facilitators for the anti-racism um, Pro training program that we have in the general church. And um, I thought that because they wanted to be trainers that we would describe the definition of racism and then we would have them practice it and we would move on to the next part of the training model. I wanna share with you that every day of the five days we were online together, we had to revisit the definition of racism because it is that disruptive to the way we understand racism in our culture and in our societies. And the fact that we assume that this is something that we talk about every day. The discussion about racism is uh, one or the definition of racism is one we say, or I say, um, there are so many definitions of racism. I say they, they're like opinions. We have um, 
as many definitions of racism as we have belly buttons, right? So the reality is in order for us to have a substantial and generative conversation about um, being anti-racist and racism, we must have a common language or a shared definition. And what I wanna offer to you all this morning is that if we can agree on one part of this definition that we saw just from this video, and that is racism is rarely about individual attitudes and prejudices. What we are experiencing right now in our nation is not about individual um, people. It is not bad about bad apples. It is not about criminals um, who want to steal purses out of stores. It is about a system of oppression that has been in place for hundreds of years that has not been discussed in our history and that has conscripted us into a narrative to believe that it is about a choice and not about embedded policies and practices that have shaped our understanding of each other. And also I wanna say that is counter to the narrative that we receive from the words and the actions of Jesus Christ. So then the answer to the question, what does the Bible have to do with it? What does the Bible have to do with anti-racism? You all answer that question by choosing this text. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because God has anointed me to bring the good news to the poor. God has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and to recover and the recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then Jesus rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And here is your theme. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on Jesus. I want to begin our exploration of this text this morning with the end in mind. When Jesus had read the scroll and read the scripture and he said, today this scripture has been realized in your hearing. And then all spoke well of him and were, were amazed at his gracious words. And then they said, is this not Joseph's son? I want to spend a minute here talking about how at that moment, Jesus was one of them. How happy we are when our young adults come back home, come to church. Some of our churches, not all of them, it's a cultural celebration. We have a Sunday marked off on our liturgical calendar for homecoming. And we are so excited when our young people come home, but more importantly, we're excited that when they're away and when they're home, that they demonstrate all that we have poured into them, particularly they're the teachings of Jesus Christ, the teachings of the gospel. And in the same way, I, in my um, imagination, I believe that these were excited that one of their own had come back to the synagogue and read from the prophet Isaiah. And I also want to say that I believe that those words that Jesus spoke to them were words they longed to hear. They longed to hear that the hand of God and the Holy Spirit remained on their side. And Jesus reminded them that. 
that the spirit of the Lord was upon him to come and to set the captives free, to um, proclaim release to the captives and to um, we, we, we turn sight to the blind. And this is, uh, to, this is a message to those who have been held captive to empire. And so these are the words that they long to hear. And Jesus says this to them and they are like, is he not one of our own? Aren't we so proud of him? And they were until he said the next words and he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down and all the eyes were fixed on him and he said today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing again in my prophetic imagination I'm wondering they're sitting there and they're saying well, who is he to tell us to give us a commentary on what is happening today and how the prophet Isaiah prophecy is being realized today coming from this young person? How, what, what must he know? And so they stared at him because Jesus represented to them in this particular statement, what I would say cognitive dissonance. Here you have this young person, he was 30, so he might've been an old man back in first century Palestine. That's, you know, 30 is young to us now, but back then you're a pretty grown man. But here is this young person coming back and giving us an indictment on our society and culture today. And I want to step back a bit and say one of the things that I love as a minister or as a, a, a trained, a theologically trained minister is that Luke's gospel, if you read it from the perspective of those who are marginalized and those who are oppressed, is an indictment and a warning that the Jews were in danger or maybe had even become the very essence of what and who they were against. I'm gonna say that again. The gospel of Luke is uh, what comment, um, biblical commentators call is a polemic. It is an indictment against empire. So while we think that the gospel of Luke is about the Holy Spirit, which it definitely is. And the story of Jesus and Jesus' relationship with humanity, the reality is it is a polemic. It is an indictment, a warning that the Jews were in danger if they had not already become the very essence of what they were against. The Jews were living in an oppressive empire and their silence, like the moving walkway that Beverly Tatum Daniels reminds us of her, in her definition of what it means to be anti-racist. Their silence was equal to complicity with the oppression that the empire was imposing on those who were marginalized by its ability to create wealth and not share wealth with those who helped build that wealth. And so when Jesus says, today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing, he is challenging them that they might themselves be provoked to do the very works, not just the words of what the scroll from Isaiah says. I don't know if you can see this on your um, screen there, but I did my best to highlight the word to in each of these iterations of what Jesus says he, Jesus says the, um, the prophet is saying, to bring good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. It is not to just say that there are poor people 
and they should listen to us. They're our captives and they should be released. It is not an us and them treatise, but it is a call to action. That the spirit of the Lord is upon us to bring good news to the poor. Action, bring good news to the poor. The spirit of the Lord is upon us to proclaim in our 2020 vision, Dick Ham reminds us that we are to be the good news from our doorsteps to the ends of the earth. The good news, if we are, if we take the name of Christ's disciples, then we are to be witnesses to the good news of what it means to be Christ's disciples, to proclaim release to the captives. Now we had more time and we were actually in a, a, a class on Luke's gospel. We might want to interrogate who was captive? Who are the captives? But if we are to apply this text to our current context, we know who is captive. And we can't remain on the moving sidewalk and be silent. We must be a part of the liberating process. We must be witnesses of the good news. We must proclaim release to the captives. And we must be intentional about determining what that means in our particular context. Friends, this is very difficult for me to talk to my computer and not um, have interaction. And so um, charge anything that I say to my um, head and not my heart. But I'm gonna go off script for a moment here and say, I was very appreciative of the way we set up, you all set up this virtual regional assembly, particularly with the welcome. I really enjoyed the welcome. But in case you haven't noticed, I am a black woman. And so I have a lens that I see things from. And so the lens that I see things from is I saw a whole lot of white people saying welcome. And that is nothing to be ashamed of, to be really clear about that. But the reality is when you think about what it means to proclaim release to the captives in your context, it's gonna be very different than the way I see it because I have a lens of African-American woman who socially locates myself in diverse cultures and environments. So I live in Chicago and I'm signed up to be a poll monitor. I am committed to getting people out to go vote their conscience, right? But I live in a context where everybody, many people look like me and many people don't look like me. And so when I say I wanna be a poll monitor and I wanna help people get to the polls and I wanna make sure people have a chance to vote their conscience, it means something very different in my community than it might mean in a community that looks homogenous. And because we look homogenous does not mean we think and live and do homogenous. I wanna be really clear about that because we all look alike doesn't mean we are all alike. And so we have to be in the work of what it means of discernment of what the Holy Spirit, which is what Luke's gospel is always reminding us of, what the Holy Spirit is empowering us to do in such a time as this. What does it mean in your context to proclaim release to the captives? I think I said earlier in, um, in this uh, conversation that um, it's inconvenient. This uh, work around anti-racism is inconvenient. Um, I, I definitely don't wanna take time away from work uh, to try to convince people to um, go to the polls or to mail in their votes. I don't have time for that. But my conscious of being an anti-racism practitioner means that I have to make sure that everybody who has the capacity exercises their right and their participation in this democratic pro um, process that we call the United States of America. That's anti-racism practitioner for me. And it's inconvenient. It's disruptive, as we said in the last screen. 
it is disruptive. It means, as the young woman said, it means that we're gonna have to walk in the other direction of the moving sidewalk. But it is liberating. And one of the things about Luke's gospel that I also um, want to say from my um, theological lens is that when we define what it means to be captive, what it means to recover the sight um, of the blind and to let the oppressed go free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, we have to realize that when, if Luke is offering an indictment on uh, those who are comfortable in the empire, if he is um, accusing them of being complicit in perpetuating oppression, or if he lived today, if he was calling them racist, you know, and, or non or, or racist, even though they see themselves as non-racist. If Luke were here today, Luke would, I believe Luke would be saying, be writing to us and saying to us that liberation is a two-way street. That to be an anti-racist in this culture is not to say, wow, this is really a problem and we just see things differently. And if, you know, those people would stop protesting the streets and stop burning trash cans and breaking in the buildings. And if they would just, if we could just all think and be alike, we would not have this dilemma. And I think Luke would say, the oppressed and those who silently, unwittingly, and those who intentionally participate in the oppression of those who are in, in our case experiencing racial oppression, that the liberation is a two way street. Those who are captive to the narrative of racism, who don't even know that we have been conscripted since birth into a racialized society. And those of us who do know and know that we benefit from the various privileges that a racialized society offers us. Both have the opportunity to be liberated in this gospel call to action. And that is what excites me. Another part of the training that uh, we experienced this week as we were um, practicing this model of anti-racism training the new trainers um, spent a lot of time, how can I say this, uh, breaking down or uh, unpacking what it means to have hope in times like this. And so they said, similar to what I said about, you know, watching the uh, welcome from this, um, this regional assembly, they said, if we were invited to do an anti-racism training in Louisville, Kentucky right now, I don't know that I would feel comfortable as a trainer trying to help people understand that there is hope in the work of anti-racism. And we talked, um, we probably spent an easily 30 minutes, maybe even an hour more than I wanted to spend on that subject. But I understand that we have to process this. This is not, um, this is inconvenient, this is disruptive, and this is liberating work that has to liberate us both in both directions. So when we talk, when we had to think about how do we address hope in what seems like a hopeless situation? And let's be clear that racism, as Maya Angelou said, trouble doesn't start when you see it. Racism didn't start in the uprising of 2020. And it didn't start in 1492. Racism has been with us since as, as long as humanity has been able to categorize humanity and to exercise power over each other. But Jesus offers us a counter narrative. That's what the Bible says. So the reason why I love Luke's gospel so much is not because Luke accuses the Jews of being complicit, of being the oppressor. That's not what I like about it. I have hope. The only reason why I show up for this work 
is not because I want to skip over, as someone said um, on our town hall webinar the other night, that I want to skip over Saturday. I want to go straight from Good Friday to Easter. No, but I have hope that Saturday is what keeps us getting up and staying in the conversation and the struggle to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. If I just sit in the bad news, if I just sit in the fact that many African-Americans, and I do not speak for all African-Americans, but I will say this, were not remotely surprised at the verdict that came out in Louisville, Kentucky. At the least, I mean, not even, I mean, not even shocked, not even pretending to be shocked that there would be no indictment against the murder of a black woman in her home. But what I can say is that as black Christians and members of a denomination, a movement church that calls itself disciples of Christ, we understand ourselves not as people full of hope, but people who are provoked and convicted to continue to be the good news of Jesus Christ from our doorsteps to the ends of the earth to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor is 2020. And in the midst of this hopelessness, we are convicted by the actions of Jesus Christ, not just the words. And so I took that from your regional minister, by the way. I love that. I'm going to preach all over the, all over the country. But the, the reality is that 2020 is a very difficult year. I mean, I had someone um, post on my Facebook page, 2020 can go to H-E double hockey sticks. And then someone after Ruth Bader Ginsburg died. And then the, immediately a friend posted back, it, it's already there. And I said, I believe, again, I'm not jumping to Easter Sunday. I believe this is our opportunity. We are going to be inconvenienced. We are going to be disruptive. And we are going to be our, the agents of our namesake. And we are going to be liberators while we are being liberated. I didn't mean to preach. So I want to step back because you got a good preacher coming behind me um, in a few minutes. But I did want to um, somehow to figure out how to engage you guys on like, so what do we do? So now that, you know, you've preached to us and told us we have, you know, we're going to be inconvenienced. We're going to have to be on this moving sidewalk, walking in the wrong direction or the different, not the wrong direction, but the opposite direction. We're going to embrace and embody God's or Christ's counter cultural narrative. How do we do that? So now I'm going to stop sharing. I think. Yes. And here I am. Okay. So, well, the first thing, since this is my backdrop, uh, we are going to give generously uh, in the special offering on this Sunday and next Sunday. So behind me or my um, backdrop is the artwork for our special offering theme this year coming from guess where? The Gospel of Luke. Um, chapter uh, 19 verses 39 and 40. The rocks are crying out. Um, please go to our website and pull down the video. I'm so proud of our young people who put that video together. But at, at base, this theme is very consistent with your theme. This theme says, if you are silent, if we are silent and we miss this move of God, we miss what God is doing when Jesus is entering into Jerusalem. Because this is a spirit moment, even the rocks will acknowledge the holiness of this moment. And so while we might see what's happening in our, in our urban centers as 
um, irreverent and uh, disrespectful, I believe God is in the midst of us. And we will join the chorus of the rocks crying out so that we might be able to, move my face out of the way, we might be able to show up and to speak up and to stand up for those who cannot show up for themselves, for those who cannot speak up for themselves and for those who cannot stand up for themselves. And so I think that also offers you, and I'm gonna to try to drop that so that you all can see my lovely earring. No, just kidding. Um, I'm gonna drop that background for a while because I wanna um, do some show and tell on my end here. Hi, it's just me and my um, bland office walls here. Um, so we're back. Um, so one of the ways you can do, you can show up, speak up and stand up. One of the ways you can um, get off of the moving sidewalk or to turn and uh, walk against the grain or just to, to swim against the, the current uh, is to have, and I know you have done this, you could start reading books. You could, you could begin to educate yourself. That is the first thing anti-racism educators say, you know, is to educate yourself. Uh, and we start, I started off this conversation with, we have to be clear about what we're talking about. If we say the Bible and anti-racism, we need to understand what we mean by anti-racism, right? So um, one of my um, favorite books and my trainers always give me a hard time about this. Um, well, one of my favorite books, for, for white audiences is, and it's published by Chalice Press, so that's another reason why it's one of my favorite books, is Anxious to Talk About It by Carolyn Helsel, um, published by Chalice. So, um, and the thing I like about Carolyn's book is that it's case study focused and um, it, case studies give us a chance to do stories. I don't know about you, um, but I'm, I, re, I re learned when I was younger and I bought my first house and I was putting up pictures and all this stuff. And I realized I don't really like reading instructions. And when I realized that was probably some of the hard time I had with history books and things like that is they weren't as um, inviting as narratives. You know, so if you give me history and a narrative, I'm, I'm all down for it. So she gives you not only case studies, but she gives you questions to ask. So you can do this individually and you can do it collectively. So history and a narrative. So if you just really want, and this is, I brought this book out for Oklahoma. I'm an indigenous people, uh, history of the United States. So I have taught this um, at Lexington Theological Seminary and not this book, but I've used this book in a class that I taught. And the participants in that class were like, why do you hate us? So, because this book was so disruptive. Um, it's by uh, Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz. It's probably backwards on your screen. Um, but the reason why I, I, I show you all this book is because I encourage you, and anytime you hear me speak, I encourage you to read history from a non-white centered perspective. And the reason why the students ask me, you know, why do you hate us? This book was so hard to read. It wasn't that it was, um, it, re it reads very well, but it is so inconsistent with anything we've ever learned in history. And it's disruptive, but guess what? So is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then um, a basis, you all have an anti-racism team there. And um, I hope you like the members on that team. But the basis of um, the model that they instruct you on comes from Joseph Bart. Um, can you see his name? Um, Becoming an Anti-Racist Church or his initial book, which is um, Understanding and Dismantling Racism. So the model that we use in the Christian church, Disciples of Christ, and this, um, this bibliography is on our website, so don't worry about taking notes. Um, the basis of the model of anti-racism education that we use in the Christian Church Disciples of Christ is based on Joseph Burnt's model. So that's um, the reason why I offer this is because if we're gonna have a common understanding, we need to understand some of the assumptions that our training, um, that our training offers us. And lastly, I did mention Ibram Kendi. Here's his book, How to Be an Anti-Racist. I, di I disagree with his definition, 
but I do agree with his um, explanation of how policies and systems perpetuate racism. And he also has a phenomenal book that I really do like. Um, and it's called Stamp from the Beginning. That's a book pre previous to this. And this is an amazing book. So, so one way is to read, is to educate yourself. Another way is to talk about it. So you may have heard me in other um, settings talk about our one cup of tea, uh, one bag of tea, one cup, one relationship. So we have a program you can order from my um, office or my website, or you can just do this in your fellowship hall or online. Grab a cup of tea or a cup of coffee or whatever you put in your coffee mug is up to you and invite someone to have an intentional dialogue about who you guys are. Not just about racism, but who you are. Because this conversation is so disruptive, we don't wanna to talk to strangers about something that we don't know their walk. So what we do in the one bag of tea is we just ask them, who are you? And so it's a structured conversation. I invite you to, um, to try that in your church homes. So um, Colton and Pam, am I close to my time? I'm not reading the chat that well. Oh, I like people who are affirming me though. Bless your hearts. I do see that. Um, no, but um, I believe that we were supposed to start at 1015. I had a full hour. So I have a few more minutes. I have about 10 minutes, April. Oh, lovely. Okay. Um, so uh, just as I believe that uh, Jesus' call to ministry that is documented in uh, the Gospel of Luke chapter four, um, I believe that it is not just Jesus' call, but those of us who are called by Jesus' name are compelled uh, to live into um, the, um, the work of living out our conviction as Christians. And it doesn't mean that it's always swimming against the current it doesn't mean that we're always um, walking in the opposite direction of the moving sidewalk, but it also means that we are developing relationships. I fundamentally believe that on top of educating ourselves, and the reason why we have the one bag of tea, one cup, one relationship program is because anti-racism work and even being a Christian is relational work at its foundation. Um, so, and so, some of you all uh, live in areas where um, you have faith-based or faith-rooted community organizing. So the way in which people approach justice making in their community. And part of the community organizing model is to um, agitate, uh, particularly uh, elected officials to hold them accountable. I fundamentally believe that, and they do a good job of doing that, but it's not just to agitate and leave alone. But you can't agitate me if I don't have a relationship with you. If I'm not in a relationship with you, there is nothing you can do to tick me off. I mean, you might disappoint me, piss me off, but you might hurt me, but you can't provoke me to do anything if I disagree with you unless we're in relationship. So, um, I encourage you all to um, have a process where if we're gonna take the work and the words of Jesus seriously, then on top of educating ourselves, that we are compelled and convicted as well to build uh, relationships across our differences. I'm not talking about pulpit supply or pulpit exchange, but serious work around building relationships. And some of that starts right at home. One of the things about one bag of tea that um, some people have told us have done it is like, oh my God, I had no idea that the folks in my congregation were so diverse. So you can do that in your own congregation. So that if you are going to have these kinds of difficult, disruptive, inconvenient conversations, that it begins with a center and a base of caring and love for each other 
And that comes out of intentional relationship building. And I guess lastly, I would say um, is to just know that you are never alone in this work. Um, the lie of racism is that it is individual. And the lie of racism is that there's a such thing as human hierarchy. And human hierarchy at its best is divisive. And so what racism says to us is that we um, are so different that our differences are necessary, but we never have to um, confront the ways that we are the same. And I believe at base that Jesus's call to proclaim the good news, the year of the Lord's favor, Jesus's call to us to release the captives and Jesus's call to us to give sight to the blind is to acknowledge our own captivity, to acknowledge our own blindness and to acknowledge that Jesus has given us the ability and the confidence and the courage through our faith to affect Jubilee in the lives, in our own lives and the lives of those around us. And until we live into the courage of our convictions, we will continue to be on the moving sidewalk, perpetuating a narrative that our silence is going to affirm that difference and division is God's intention. And there's nothing about the gospel of Jesus Christ that affirms that. And so I pray for you that you will, in your decision-making today, in your worship today, that you will be reminded that the Holy Spirit, through the witness of Jesus Christ and the words of Jesus Christ in the Bible, both convict and compel us to proclaim the year of the Lord and to proclaim Jubilee for all of God's children. May it be so. And thank you so much for having me this morning as um, your Bible lecturer. Blessings on your decisions in your regional assembly today. May they be generative and life-giving.